All right. We are live. Oh, I'm adjusting my position here. Hello, Sean Combs. How's I haven't going, seen Tom? I haven't seen you in a week since you low hold me on the bat and kill. I did not low hold you. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> you low hold me on the bat and kill. <laughs> you're you're so sneaky. You were hidden in the bushes and I didn't see you. Yeah. Well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> neither of us I, caught any fish that day though <laughs> fair enough fair enough that's awesome uh so yeah we're gonna talk about reels today huh yeah let's not get into it yet because i don't see anybody saying hi or coming in so let's let's uh let's ease into it sean easy all right cool. ease, ease into it <clears throat> So you think the carp will be? Uh, you think the carp will be eaten soon? Yeah, I, I had to go to. I had to drive over the bridge of our. Shh, don't don't. Favorite yeah. Flat. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. And there were two or three fish at at uh, on our favorite flat, cruising, cruising around. So. Ooh. Yeah. And our now, friends. Now we got people here. Now yeah. we got everybody here. I don't see. I see Anita. I'm talking to Anita tomorrow. Hey, Anita. Dave Rossett's here. Dave Raleigh's here. Barry's here. Ralph is here. Cam is here. Mark is here. Bruce is here. Darwin's here. I'm getting to recognize a lot of these a lot of these names from our fly yeah. tying sessions and otherwise. Yeah, they're they're lunchtime friends. Yes, they are. They are. They're keeping me from my lunch. Spencer's here. Allie's here from Colorado. Nice. Steve's here from California. Kimberly's here from Fountain. I don't know where Fountain is. Chris from Logan, Utah. Joe from Westchester. Boy, Sean, you're a popular guy. They got people coming from all over to listen to you today. I don't think that's they're here to listen to you. <laughs> no, they're here to find out who wins the reel. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you can't make friends, buy them. Yeah. It's awesome. So I have one. Do you? Yeah. Drew dropped one off at my house. The problem is, it's a four. What am, the hell am I going to do with a with a hydros four in Vermont at this time of year, guys? I, I could, couldn't I couldn't I have gotten a two or a three? Huh? Mine's a mine's a four as well. Oh, that's and, all they were uh, giving out, huh? <laughs> that's all they were giving out. No, I've got this actually. I've been running this one on uh, a trout space setup. Oh, can I exchange this one for a smaller one? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I do like the I do like the color. Awesome. All right, so um, it looks like it looks like people are are um, are here. Lots of people are here, so we shouldn't bore them with um, mindless blather, but we should talk about reels. And um, I just want to start before you start, because once you start, I won't get a word in edgewise, um, that reels are probably, um, unless you're um, saltwater fishing or fishing for salmon or steelhead, reels are probably one of the the least important parts of your gear, but they're probably one of the, um, the one where there's a, a lot of personal, a lot of personal uh, personality and personal preference goes into it. And, and it's, you know, they're, they're the, they're things of beauty and they're really, they're really uh, to have a nice reel on a nice rod is, is, uh, you know, it just complements the outfit, but it's, Nowhere, I think, can you get more personal in your tackle selection, um, both with color and and style and size and and function. So, um, you know, it's probably not your reel is probably not as important as your leader, but um, they're sexier. All right, That's, I'm done. Now you can talk. Well, I'm going to go ahead and contradict you because. Uh, I used to think, you know, this is probably 15, 20 years ago, that a reel was the least important thing for trout fishing because it was just a line holder for taking up the line when you were moving from spot to spot. And um, and what I've really sort of come to appreciate about a good, nice reel 
is that uh, for trout fishing specifically, um, you know, tip protection is really important. And so, you know, you're, you're, if you get a fish on the reel and say you're dry fly fishing, uh, you're going to get a fish on the reel. If you're dry fly fishing, you're probably making, you know, a fixed length cast with maybe 10 or extra feet out of slack in the water if you're weight fishing. So you don't have a lot of line to manage. You feed the fish, it's pretty quick going to come up on the reel if it's a hefty fish where you need tip of protection. And then from that point on, uh, you know, I used to fish reels that didn't have uh, low start inertia. And so every time the fish made a run or stopped or started, Tom, it would, you know, it would just be, you know, kind of just tense and um and that's where i like a real like the mirage lt where it has really smooth really you know finely adjustable men drag to i'd say three quarter pound to a pound and you start thinking about that and you're like oh what's three quarter pound my tippet my 6x breaks at two and a half uh but what you really don't realize is whether it's an overhand knot a nick in the tippet um a poorly rushed tied knot you know, it just all of those things come into play. And then the, and when you're talking about like a half pound at the reel, there's a lot of drag that picks up, um, with your line going through a bent rod and, you know, and drag on the water. So it all adds up. And I, I actually have come to in the last 10 or 15 years, come to really appreciate a fine, uh, controllable, uh, drag setting on a trout reel. Um, which is something that I didn't really appreciate until I started, you know, really fishing, um, you know, tricky fish that are a little bigger on smaller flies and lighter tippet. That's fine for people like you that catch big fish, but the, the, <laughs> the, the, you, you make, you make a very good point. I think I've been spoiled by reels with good drag systems, so I don't think about it, but yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, uh, I've not the guy who always catches big fish, but I grew up catching bass and I never put a fish on a reel. Uh, and then when I started really kind of digging into trout and dry fly fishing or even like tight lining, uh, with six X fluoro, um, you know, or, or indicator fishing or streamer fishing, maybe not as much, uh, because you know, my tippet's going to be probably at least eight, if not 12 pounds there. So, you know, that's more of a, a control of fish uh for some runs and stuff like that but when you get into light line stuff it's really important i think and then uh jeff makes a good point drag is also influenced by how the rod is held and positioned on a fish as well no uh it is uh, <coughs> it's a good good call out jeff uh you know if you drop your rod and you fight with the butt section uh and you're not kind of pulled way back over your head uh, then, you know, you have less drag through the 12 or so guides. And if you, you know, if you think about, uh, you know, you can do this test yourself, tie your, your fly line to, uh, you know, a small rock or something like that and try pulling it and seeing where, you know, which angle of the rod is going to put more pressure on the rock versus bending the rod and putting more pressure on the rod. Um, so that all plays into account as well. Tyler asks, what is both your guys' favorite weight for reels? Uh, depends on the rod, Tyler. Um, I'll go first. So for for a 9-foot-5 weight, I like to be in uh, mid-4 ounces. I really want a reel that's, that's light uh, but doesn't disappear uh, because I think that it throws off the swing weight of a rod a little bit. But, you know, Mirage LT is a good example. I think that um, here's – Here's a size three. Um, this would be a six weight or seven weight, uh, more than likely. And then uh, I usually use a size two Mirage LT on my nine foot five weight, nine foot four weight. And those are like 4.2 ounces, I believe. Um, so they're pretty light, uh, but they still offer tremendous drag as opposed to like if I go to a creek reel uh, for like a little super fine glass, I'm going to have a, a CFO click and Paul. Um, drag's less important aesthetics. And to Tom's point before, you know, personality is probably more important. Um, you know, whenever I'm just doing some small stream fishing and having fun. What about you, Tom? I don't, I don't really have a favorite weight. <laughs> you know, I, I, 
I, I look at the reels aesthetics and the, uh, the fine end of the drag. Um, I don't worry too much about the heavy end of the drag. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't pay much attention to weight of reel. I, I don't even know what, what my reels weigh. But yeah. Uh, I pay attention a little bit. Like this is my tight line reel, which is a Mirage size two. And the reason why I have this on a 10 foot two weight is because it's a little heavier than a Mirage LT and it's actually going to help counterbalance uh, quite a bit to, to help out with kind of, you know, fishing in a, an extended higher reach all day. Um, I like to have a little bit of weight on the back end of a down locker with a longer rod. Uh, Michael has a, has a really good question. Can you talk about the design differences between a traditional modern fly reel versus a quote spay reel? Any big difference between using a four weight spay reel versus a six for seven weight traditional reel, six or seven weight traditional reel? Yeah. So there's probably going to be a couple of different, you know, not knowing which spay reel you're talking about, but most, uh, if you were to go back to like the, an old CFO six, it's going to be a full cage, which means that, uh, the line guard connects all the way around inside of the spool. Um, that helps quite a bit for running line and, and, um, backing not to migrate through, uh, the reel, um, between the frame and the spool. And uh, they're going to be traditional arbors, so they're going to be, you know, really narrow diameter around the, the shaft of the spool, if you will, the hub, uh, versus a, a, a large arbor, which is going to have a higher increased pickup. It's going to have less line coiling, um, and it is uh, going to look totally different, right, than a traditional uh, a reel with a small standard arbor. So it all comes down to line pickup. Uh, and, you know, you can't really fit those disc drag, fully sealed systems uh, inside of a traditional arbor reel. So that's why over time we've gone to mid arbors and then now large arbors, which are really, if you look at, look at a reel like this, um, you know, it's a size six Mirage USA. Uh, it's a four and a quarter, four and a half reel uh, in diameter. And it has, you know super awesome disc drag and has high line retrieve and pick up um, really good control of how you're fighting fish with drag and when you're going to you know allow them to have some line and when you want to stop them so it's a good question though there's a lot a lot to it roger bird has a good question what's the best way to set the drag on a reel that's a really good question uh, so I would say the way I do it is I usually go with the, the least amount of drag that, uh, during a hookup on the run of a fish, if it runs and stops, it's not going to overspool. Uh, I always like to start light and then move into a heavier drag if needed, then hook a fish and in its first run go, Oh man, this is, you know, it's, there's a lot of tension in the line and then, you know, bam, you lose your fish. So I typically will be uh, one or two clicks in. There's a couple ways you can do this. Um, I've seen it done where you would put everything together and then have a fixed weight, um, say it be, you know, a, a half pound or something like that, and just hang it to your reel uh, and then back the drag off until it falls on its own to the ground. So if you think about taking you know, a quarter pound or a half pound, attaching it to your tippet, your reel's not onto your fly rod at this point, uh, having it max drag. And if you want your setting to be roughly, and this is, this isn't, you know, with tools like an Instron, but just a stuff you have in your kitchen, maybe, uh, you can loosen your drag until the spool freely drops with that quarter pound on your line. Uh, that's a good place to start. I, would you how, do you have a difference of opinion, Tom? Because you know fly fishing is all about everybody. Everybody has an opinion, but what do you think? No, I just pull on it and 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 estimate. <laughs> you know, th but I do put it to the lightest setting, the lightest setting uh, that I can to start. Yeah. Even with something like tarpon, there's a there's a big difference where you wanna you want a stripping. You want a stripping drag, but then as soon as you cast or make a presentation of the fish, you want to tighten right up. Uh, 
But for trout, I just said it fairly light. Yeah. Seth has a question. I've been fishing in eight way for many years and love it for catching basically everything I target. What would be a good midweight setup to better target trout? Nine foot five weight. I can answer that one. Depending on where you are, but it's pretty hard to go wrong with a nine foot five weight. Uh, Spencer says, when stuck on the bottom, why is my tippet consistently snapping off blood knot tied instead of my knot tied to the hook? Uh, I would I would practice your blood knot, Spencer, and uh, make sure that you're tying them properly. Uh, I would make sure that you're no more than two thousandths of an inch difference between sections. I would um, I would make sure you're making five turns on your blood knot, not three or four as people used to tell us. And if that fails, I would try a triple surgeon's knot. <laughs> but it's going to break somewhere, right? It's going to break at one of those two knots. It's not going to break in the middle of your tippet um, because knots are, are never 100% except yeah. for bimini twists. Uh, you, can you see that question from James, which is a good one? Can I expect the drag to feel different between a reel that has been dunked versus when it is dry? Uh, that's in a older depends style. on the reel. Yeah, it depends on the reel. On an older style non sealed disc drag reel, um, you know, if you were using like a an older cork uh, drag surface that is open to elements, then yeah, you could you could expect that. But uh, for a sealed drag, um, it really doesn't change because the sealed housing itself uh is not going to take on any moisture and that's where all the mechanics and mechanical parts that are creating the drag pressure are hey before we take any more questions because they're ranging all over the place um i think it would be good if you would go through the orvis reel series and sure. um yeah. and so if you hold your questions for a minute so that we don't lose them um, you know, go through the Orvis Real Series just so people can compare them and know what they're getting for each price point. Yeah, so uh, the the flagship Real Series that we have is the Mirage, and we offer that from size two up to six. Um, it's a U.S. made product. It uh, has a a patented drag system that uh, is allows you to have fine adjustments at lower drag settings, and then within one rotation of a drag knob, you can get into the maximum amount of drag force, uh, which is really nice. Um, and then, you know, that, that system, another nice thing about these reels is they're type three anodized, which are more scratch resistant. Um, they also have, uh, I would call it belts and suspenders seals approach. So everywhere there's a, an entry point to the disc drag system, there's two seals, um, which is really nice. And from there, uh, their little brother, if you will, is the Mirage LT. So this is really a freshwater reel, maybe up to bonefish reel. A lot of people like these for bonefish in a size four. Um, these are offered from size one to four. They, um, they have pretty much almost all of the design uh, that goes into the, to its big brother, but just with consideration to weight. Um, so single seals. Uh, type two anodization instead of three, um, you know, thinner walled. We really tuck a lot of the weight out of this reel uh, with opening some of the porting on the frame itself. And, um, and then the drag on the Mirage USA drags tend to like in a size six, it'll go up to 16 plus pounds. And on a Mirage LT, um, they're just set up for a lighter game and they'll go up to about eight pounds, uh, you know, but a size one would be, like up to about three pounds. So um, from there, uh, we get into the Hydros. This is new for this year. Um, this is a large arbor reel that has been redesigned. Um, and really the redesign here was more of a improvements upon a great reel. Um, it, uh, it's benefited from the hard work that Mirage and Mirage LT has laid out in our family of reels. And so you get updates like a curved radius foot on the um, on the reel foot itself, so if you're running your your leader behind it, it's not going to kink. Uh, it has a flush counterbalance now. If you can see that, the handle's been improved where it's smoother <clears throat> operating. Um, the drag knob is, I think, much improved. 
Um, it's just got a better ergonomic surface. Um, it kind of, it's a little, it's a little brother to the LT in a way. It's a little heavier. Um, the drag performance is not going to be necessarily as smooth um, as the LT. The LT's sort of got an, a, a step up on that in a pretty big way. And, uh, and it doesn't have the ball and ramp patented adjustable drag system. So instead of having a nonlinear curve from min to max, uh, you're going to get a linear curve. So if you, if you're the low end, you're going to get to that max drag a lot faster. Um, and then, uh, from there, we well, have... well, the two most, Im I think the two most important points in, in the, in the hydros is that it, um, is smaller and lighter than the older hydros for the same capacity so it better yeah. fit better fits modern lightweight rods and it's not made in vermont not made in usa yep. i mean those uh, i think those are the two the two two bigger points for yeah function. that's that's probably uh one of the one of the points that would also apply to mirage lt is with the big game uh mirage usa we have super large arbors so we're for a given rod weight and reel size, where a larger diameter, almost a full size up, and a larger arbor, we did that for these reels um, to have higher line retrieve. And then when you go to the uh, Mirage LT, they're going to be smaller diameter reels. So a size four is a true four inch reel, um, which is typical industry standard instead of a 4.2 or four and a quarter reel. Uh, Okay. You want to talk yeah. about the bat batten kills now? Yeah. So then, uh, well, just to round off the large arbor uh, side of things, the the clear water is a is a new reel for last year, and and it's basically um, a workhorse. You know, it's a cast reel. It's not machined from bar stock. Uh, it's investment casted, and um, you know, and it's a it's a good reel. It's not gonna be. Um, the best reel from a drag standpoint. So if you're, if you're going saltwater, you know, I strongly encourage people to step up, um, to, you know, hydros or a mirage. If you're going to be doing a lot of freshwater fishing and you're good about taking care of your equipment, it's a really great starting place for a large harbor reel. And on the other side of, of the spectrum, we have a couple of, uh, reels in the bat and kill line, which I don't have one of them with me today, but they're um, they're pretty neat. The bat and kill click uh, pairs really well with a lot of our small stream rods. So rods shorter than than eight foot. Um, it's a it's a really simple set it and forget it click and pull reel that offers a lightweight package that's no frills but just gets it done. Um, it has a traditional porting. Um, so when I say traditional porting, just a whole pattern like on this CFO. Uh, on both sides and uh, you know that's an aesthetic they're they're also smaller reels in diameter uh, to be lighter weight uh, one of the downsides to that is that you have more uh, memory in your line so line cooling when you pull it off and if you're taken up it's less line retrieve from a turn turn and spool it in rate you know so a lot of times you're sitting there and your buddies are all gone because they've they've already um, reeled up and you're still working on it but <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but you know, Hey, who said fishing isn't about slowing down anyway. And then in that same bat and kill line, we have a mid Arbor disc drag reel, um, that actually shares a drag system with the hydros SL, but it's offered in a traditional look with traditional porting and in a mid Arbor. Uh, and those reels are pretty cool, uh, because they go up to a four and five, uh, solid back full cage spay reel. So really great for two handed casting heavier to balance longer rods and all that. And that from front to back, um, that's our real lineup as a whole, which, uh, it's pretty solid real lineup. You know, it's ever evolving and we're always kind of tinkering to, to continue to improve the lineup, but, but that's it as a whole. Um, here's a good question. Uh, from Travis, the original Hydros SL feels heavier than the latest release. Can you highlight the differences between the two? Are the new spools interchangeable with the SL reel? Love my new Hydros reel. Yeah, so uh, so no, the, the spools aren't interchangeable. And the biggest difference Tom touched on just a minute ago is that we tucked the super large, the SL with super large arbor, 
and we went back to a standard arbor because um, basically the customers said for a given line weight, say a five weight, I would rather fish a smaller reel with slightly less retrieve that's lighter and balances better on, on, you know, recons and helios and clear waters um, than to fish a heavier reel that's got a larger arbor and have a little bit, you know, better line retrieve. Um, at the end of the day, uh, I think the compromise in line retrieve, we went from on a size four SL, I think we went from about 10 inches per revolution to about 8.2 inches per revolution. So, um, you don't really get there. Uh, you know, you just, it's not that big of a difference. So, um, the weight compromise balancing on lighter rods was more important. Here, here's a question that you can uh, elaborate on. I think, uh, what's the main difference between saltwater and freshwater reels? Main difference between salt and freshwater reels are going to be the size of the reel and the drag package itself. Um, and then I also would say the, the durability, um, of the, of the drag sealed system, you know, uh, salt water is really corrosive stuff whenever it interacts with any non stainless or non anodized aluminum surface. And, uh, so it's really important creating a reel that, you know, you can have on a bonefish flat or you can be tarpon fishing with it and it can get dunked. And it won't allow salt water to get in because once it gets in, uh, it'll crystallize and it really um, will have a, a, a reaction and, and just completely deteriorate the metal surfaces that it comes in contact with. Um, so durability is really important. And then from the performance side of things, um, you know, saltwater game fish, whether it's redfish, bonefish, permit, snook, tarpon, GTs. Um, you usually don't get to hold the line that long when you hook one of those fish. And, uh, and that's where, you know, having, uh, control of the fish using the, the actual drag mechanism is really important. So smooth drag is important. Um, and then drag force or drag amount is really important as well. Can you see that question from Robert? I often fish alkaline freshwater there require rinsing your gear to avoid corrosion. Do you recommend any additional maintenance to seal drag reels? <clears throat> yeah, I think that the, the rinsing is a really good starting point there. Um, and, you know, honestly, uh, for seal drag reels, once you set the one-way bearing to the direction that you want to retrieve left or right hand, we, we typically don't ask people to uh, dig into the reels and, you know, because there's more – more possibility that you're, you know, you're going to allow, once you take a frame cap off, you may allow some, you know, the spring or the plate, or you start, you know, the little piece falls out and goes somewhere and you can't find it in the carpet. Um, I think that, uh, it's best to, you know, on a longer term scale, if you're having problems with a reel, uh, send it into our real repair shop and we'll service an update and you know, clean it up for you. But rinsing is really important for sure. Here's a good one from Charlie. What's the best way to care for you, really? You already touched on that a little bit. Do you need to worry about it being submerged in water while unhooking a fish? I have a Hydros SL and love it. It's already three years old and would love to make it last as long as possible. Yeah, it's a, uh, you know, it's a, the Hydros SL has a seal drag. Um, it's a single seal, you know, so each entry point has only one seal. Um, doesn't really mean that that's a big deal i mean right now i would say keep fishing your reel uh make sure you keep dirt and debris a lot of times i'll submerge or drop my reel inside of a stream it'll pick up some grit and some dirt and then that will migrate and make its way into contact areas with your seal um, that's why it's important to routinely just kind of rinse off uh, your reel on those dunks uh, just because you know, sand is an abrasive material, and even though you can't see it, it's in there uh, tearing up those O-rings and compromising the seals. So that's really the tip there to, to keep it going. Yep. Um, yeah, you don't have to worry about a reel getting wet. They're made to, they're, they're made to be used in water, <laughs> but sand, uh, sand is not so good. I will say the clear water... Um, real it's not good to to dunk that for prolonged periods of time mm -hmm. 
There's a what you can you see that question from Tad? How yeah, do you balance? I, got it. Yeah. So uh, how do you balance uh, the Euro rods with the new hydros? Um, I think that uh, the new hydros is lighter than the old hydros. Uh, and it depends on the length of the rod. If you're fishing 10 footers or 10 and a half footers and which rod, but uh, twos or threes are a really good place to start. And like I mentioned earlier, I fish a two on my, uh, on my tight line rig. And I know a lot of people will fish hydroses in threes in the new one, just to pick up a little extra weight for balance. Okay. Does Orvis investigate startup drag with different line types? I imagine the line stiffness differences can influence the startup drag. Hmm. Yeah, we uh, so we measure startup inertia on uh, on an Instrom, which is a um, a device that's a column that has a load cell and can pull the line off and measure it. And uh, we do that with the reel fixed, and and we've also done some trials with the line going through uh, the rod guides just to see and it, and it gets into the complexity of the drag of the line going through the guides. So a new line that's really slick, uh, like a new pro uh, fly line with AST plus is going to have less pickup and drag through the, the rod. And, you know, you can take an old line and clean it um, with a, with a cleaning application pad um, or some, some dish soap and a rag and that's uh that's a good way to kind of handle that but we we take in consideration both sides uh, the bottom line is is if you're gonna design the reel itself and it has startup inertia in the system you'll never gonna you're never gonna like clean or slicken that out so we shoot for zero startup inertia and uh i you know and i know for a fact because we have a pretty fancy machine that all of our uh, reels don't have any startup inertia <laughs> except for the click. And that startup inertia is the first click itself. You'll see a little peak and then it comes down. And those clicks are like a tenth of a pound. So, you know, from, from click to engage to out. So, What's the best backing to use for seal drag reels? There, is there a best backing? No, it's a, that's a personal preference, right, Tom? I mean, uh, the backing yeah. itself... You know, you can use gel spun to get uh, more capacity on a reel. Um, I think gel spun takes up like 60 to 70 percent of the volume. So you can increase, um, you know, 30 to 35 percent. And, uh, you know, so that would be if you wanted to fish a smaller reel on an eight weight and have or, or a nine weight or 10 weight and have more backing capacity. But, you know, standard Dacron uh, 20 pound backing. Uh, doesn't really change the, the drag itself. Can you elaborate on the different spool release systems on each of the reels? Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be a, a little hard one-handed, but the Hydros has a pretty simple spool release system, which is a lever that uh, you push. That lever um, is affixed in the end of the shaft that the spool sets on and rests on. Um, so if you take like a Hydros apart, you're going, or a bat and kill, um, click or disc, you're just going to move this lever out of the way. It's going to have a pretty loose tolerance. Um, and that's, you know, it's a, it's a economy, uh, a lab or well, elegant economy way to affix a reel to a, a frame or spool to a frame. If you go over to the Mirage and the Mirage LT, um, those actually have a screwed mechanism or screwed cap that holds it down. And we use a, double start thread um, that will actually um, at the end of the engagement that will it'll set on the the, the shaft or the spool itself there's the spool perch and uh, thread it down and then it creates like a little bit of uh, resistance to unthread um, to be honest both of them are really nice the nice thing about the Mirage and Mirage LT is your spool to frame attachment doesn't interact with the sealed mechanism of the drag and on the hydros and bat and kill reels um, when you take the the spool off you've disassembled the drag essentially um, and you've got an open drag so uh, that's probably the biggest difference tolerances are better on the mirage 
and Mirage LT, there is some give and tolerancing on the, uh, the hydro system. Um, what you're going to find is going to feel like a little bit of wiggle uh, from frame to spool, right? Um, Jeff wants to know, probably no easy answer to this, but any tips on keeping reels from freezing up while winter fishing? I fish in Wyoming and often, oftentimes, uh, yeah, that's a, attempts. <laughs> that's a really good one. So I, I've, I've heard all the tricks, um, for a seal drag system. I actually, uh, I mean, I had this, this year, uh, Pete Kutzer and I were fishing one of the lake erie tribs and it was 15 degrees out maybe and uh, i carried an extra reel because i knew if my reel got wet i was going to set up with ice pretty quickly um the guy that i was fishing with uh you know he, he was like wow you know you're prepared normal normally you know you'd have to put your take your reel off put it under your jacket warm it back up and all that um i've heard some other people talk about spraying uh you know sprays on that you know the water doesn't uh doesn't necessarily stay on the reel long enough to accumulate i do find that a an open large arbor system is going to have less close surfaces than a standard arbor reel um to kind of allow that ice to to ice up but you know if your clicker isn't sounding because you got a little water in it and it's frozen the ball bearing down i wouldn't worry about that too much i would still fish it um, but if you've got enough ice to where you can actually rotate your reel, then, you know, you got to stop and maintenance it and warm it up. Do you set your drag higher when fishing tight water or water with heavy cover down trees when you know you, a run will end badly and you'll potentially want to stop a fish quickly or just play and pray? Yeah, I, I, uh, I was fishing with, uh, a friend last year and and I, i'm kind of notorious for uh not playing fish you know not letting them dance so to speak i like to i like to get control of fish as fast as possible and then land it as fast as possible um just to basically you know not stress the fish as much uh, jesse howler fishing with him kind of taught me that because you know from an aggressive approach and maybe it's his comp fishing background as soon as he gets a fish on, he's got a low rod angle and he's pulling the fish sideways instead of, you know, pulling it up, trying to bring it through the water column. He's, you know, in vertical orientation, he's bringing it sideways through. Um, Sean Brilliant's another good one. I was still heading with him and, and uh, he caught a steelhead and he just dropped his rod, put it in the, in the water, his tip of his rod in the water and reeled the fish right up within three feet, uh, you know, and kind of, it was like one of those dog whisper moments, right? Tom, were you there for that? That's a classic, no. brilliant, classic, <laughs> brilliant story, you know? <laughs> he said, watch this, bud. And he just like literally put his rod tip in the water and reeled a steelhead that was, I was probably 10 or 10 or 12 pound fish right up to his rod tip. And he was like, you better get the net. She's going to get loose, you know? So. Uh, David, yes, your hydros is just fine for salt water. Yep. Uh, what's the best way to refurbish a dinged up reel? Scratched up pretty bad and ugly after being lost in a reservoir and then found months later. Everything else is fine. <laughs> uh, you know, you can send it in. If it's an Orvis reel, you can send it in. Uh, contact the service center um, and then talk to one of our outfitters and send it in for reel repair. And uh, the what they'll do for, uh, you know, a, a discussed fee is they will clean it up and then we have a plethora of replacement parts. So, you know, if it was an older bat and kill large arbor or something like that, and it needed a new, a uh, new handle or something, um, they can take care of that. It's really good service that we offer for all of our reels. But Kevin probably doesn't want a, a new spool because, you know, I mean, if, if he lost it in a reservoir and then found it months later, it's probably got some sentimental value. So I wouldn't yeah. send it, I wouldn't send it in Kevin unless unless you need a new handle or a real foot or something. Yeah. Scratched, scratched up, you're not going to be able to do much, really. I would just uh, enjoy enjoy the patina on that reel. Yeah, for sure. I've, I've got some old CFOs that are older than I am um, that look awesome. Just, just uh, yeah, they've got stories to them. 
I use your gear for chasing sea run browns. Long stories at Denmark. Love the hydros and sell. Just ordered the Mirage USA three rail for my Helios 3D. My question is, will I feel a difference casting? Yeah, so probably not, uh, to be honest, because the Hydro SSL and the Mirage USA, pretty comparable weights. Um, from a casting standpoint, you're probably going to have the same balance and weight in hand. Maybe a little edge to the, the Mirage USA in a size three. It's not. I may have missed this, but how often should you lubricate the various types of reels? Good question. Click and pile versus seal drag. And how often do you lubricate the spindle? What types of lubricant are recommended? That's a really good question. <laughs> um, you know, I, I really am probably harder on my gear than I need to be uh, because of, you know, like always looking for the things that fail if you, if you don't properly maintenance gear, you know, because the, uh, look at that as it, an endurance test. Eventually everything will sort of break down and what part of that will break down. So Tom, why don't you take us through what's your annual routine of cleaning up your reels? No, you don't want to know my annual routine. Oh, I do. Because I have none. <laughs> I, I think I, I'm kind of in your school that, that I should be abusing these things. I, I never, I never clean or lubricate my reels. You know that you. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it's a, uh, it's a good one. It might be an, another topic. You set me up for that one, didn't you? Well, no, I, th <laughs> I think you, you clean your reels when you clean them out of the back of my truck. <laughs> yeah, well, well, yeah. I mean, with the COVID, I do, but other than that, I don't. No, clean no, them. no. When you clean out my reels out of the back of my truck and keep them. Yeah, yeah. Well, I got a nice one the other day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, but that that's a good question. I mean, I think that, you know, uh, from a lubricant standpoint, um, you know, if there's a lot there that you could dig into. Uh, maybe a really good one, Tom, to do as a uh, Facebook post or something like that with the guys at the rod shop um, in real repair, you know, of like what's the best practices for cleaning up and what materials to use, what lubes to use. Yeah, I know the one thing you probably shouldn't use is WD-40 because it's got a solvent in it and you might hurt your line or the seals on the drag. But, you know, I think a light, a, usually what we always recommend is a very light machine grease. That, yeah, that, yeah, uh, that's fair. There's a, there's a 3M product that we use um, and it's, uh, it's Super Lube is its trademark name. Um, that we use for our U.S. reels. And, uh, but, you know, again, for a, a fully sealed disc drag system, there's not a lot there to lubricate. You know, what you don't want to do is WD-40. You don't want to, uh, you know, take, oh, this works from a bike chain and put it on your reel and stuff like that. You want to, you, you definitely don't want to do that stuff. Um, do you ever need to lubricate the shaft on a, uh, on a sealed drag reel? Uh, no, uh, no, actually on a seal drag reel, the shaft is dry because it's actually a friction point where it contacts the, uh, uh, it contacts the, the one way bearing as, you know, as the, as the torque transmission goes. And so you don't want lubricant there. That would be the opposite effect. Uh, I think we lost Tom for, Oh, but I'm sure he's coming right back. But, uh, I was going to suggest maybe we can announce the winner now for the, Oh yeah absence but i had to i had to cough and i, I tried i tried to mute and i pressed the leave studio button by mistake <laughs> sorry about that <laughs> I, I, was, uh, just, I just <laughs> just popped in to say that maybe we could announce the winner while you're in your absence i think that's a good idea <laughs> are you ready are I'm you ready. ready are you ready roger bird <laughs> I always have to t tease uh, Roger. Seen, let's see. All right. Uh, big, big announcement. The winner, the randomly chosen winner. And I, I don't know if I've seen this person here yet, but uh, their name is Dustin Boyer Smith. Congratulations, nice. Dustin. Yay, Dustin. Yay. Congratulations. So now all the rest of you have to buy one. <laughs> All right, I'm going to hop off so you guys can finish. 
Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Julia. For Congratulations, Dustin. And I knew we would get this question. Speaking of CFOs, will you be bringing them back? I anticipated uh, this question. Yeah, I think that uh, there's always plans for CFO. You know, the, the cool thing is this uh, holiday season of 2021 will be the 50th anniversary of the CFO. Uh, we <clears throat> ran it in the 1971 holiday catalog with a picture of Santa Claus bending a rod on the front. And, uh, and so that would be pretty cool to do something for, for that anniversary. Um, definitely a, a reel that I love. It's a reel that we all, all love. I know you fish them, Tom, I fish them. Um, it's just a really great product and a really good functioning reel. So I think it'll always have its place, uh, in the Orvis reel family. Is that a little foreshadowing. Maybe. I don't know. You have to look under your Christmas tree in, in, uh, in a year and a half. Okay. I'll expect one. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Are all the Mirage LT real stiff with no drag on? Mine doesn't feel free spool like my regular Mirage or Hydros. I'm wondering if I need to send it to be checked. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. It's you need to send it in. You're talking free spool, like incoming free spool spinning, uh, or the men drag. They should have um, somewhere between an eighth and a quarter pound of men drag, and they should be easy to free spool in. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely send it in if you've got uh, an experience that's not that. That doesn't sound right. Thomas wants to know, I just started fishing pike and muskie this year. In your opinion, what would be the best reel for a nine weight for this application? Uh, that's a really good one. I mean, muskie are another one of those, uh, you know, that you definitely, um, you know, well, pike, I'll, I'll speak to pike and muskie. Uh, I would say, you know, a Mirage LT in a size four, it's all going to be about back and capacity and line size capacity. Um, I think for muskie, when you're already throwing such a big fly, I want to try to keep the weight of my rig down as much as possible. Um, you know, a lot of touch and go casting and a lot of sort of uh, just a lot of brutal casting on some bigger flies. And so I like to keep my, my rod weight and real weight down. So that's usually where I would go to a, a Mirage LT size four for, for that application. A lot of people though, um, you know, for Pike, I'm definitely there for this reel actually was set up, um, for an 11 weight with a 450 depth charge for musky. So it kind of, kind of answers that question. I think you already talked about balancing the Euro rods with the, uh, yeah. Yeah, just to just to kind of retouch on that, it's usually um, it's personal preference, but uh, balancing like a recon or a Clearwater ten three or ten two, uh, I would go up a little bit in size of reel. So, you know, usually you're gonna see a size three, um, but it's personal preference, and it's just I like it because it'll counterbalance the the rod itself, but our our Euro rods are getting lighter and lighter in swing weight and uh, uh, they're getting pretty nice and you don't need as much counterbalance. You see that next question? Yeah, I think so. You might have to read it for me, Tom. I my glasses okay. on. Okay. I have numerous small. Hydros SLs. Six of them. Any way to fill in the gap between the housing and the seat? There's a gap there and smaller tippets get caught in there. I was thinking uh, silicone or question mark. Yeah, uh, you could. That's a really good question. I mean, if you really wanted to tune it up, you could drop a little two-part epoxy in there and then wipe them down. Uh, that would fill the gap. Like So, you know, your standard uh, stuff that you would find at Home Depot – um, it's an aluminum surface to aluminum surface, not going to really hurt the reel. Uh, I would, I would add stuff to it. I wouldn't try to try to file it or anything like that because you're going to you know, take off the anodized aluminum surface finish. 
Um, but yeah, I've, I've also, you know, you, uh, if you're, if you're constantly getting that, uh, filled, um, you know, or getting that little piece, you know, I would maybe tinker with that a little bit. Or, or always make sure that you leave, you leave a little bit longer section of a uh, leader outside your reel and then it won't sneak in that gap. Oh, I think he's talking about wrapping it around the foot. Um, Oh then, yeah! Oh, yeah. I, oh, I got it. I got it. Yeah, yeah. But okay. another oh, way to okay, do okay. that. Okay. Another way to do that is to mm. attach your fly higher up on your rod and wrap it around, so your thicker section of your leader, butt section of your leader, will be in that area, and, it, and it's less likely to get caught in any little nooks or crannies. I see. Okay. Yeah. I misunderstood. Good question. I know you. Though. I know you can't use cold water lines in Belize. Any issue with using the lines? I have spoiled, spooled. I think for colder water applications, you could use a cold water line in Belize, right? Just might get a yeah. little sticky. It might get a little sticky, but you can yeah, do that. that's that's really what you're going to find is in warmer temperatures. Uh, it's just going to get a little sticky, and it's about air temperature, really. Uh, no Not different. If you took a, yeah, if you took a tropic line and you tried to fish it on a, uh, you know, 55 degree day, um, you know, somewhere, it's going to get a little stiff and coily and all that. So, uh, what was no, the main? <clears throat> sorry. No, I was going to say there's no problem with it. It's just the performance is going to be degraded a little bit. What was the main inspiration in designing the new Hydros reel? Uh, the main inspiration was listening to customers uh, like yourself and hearing what they had to say about a product that they loved and then really continuous improvement. It, was, it wasn't so much a redesign as it was a, uh, you know, kind of updating and modifying some of the, the constant feedback or the top key points. Um, we have a lot of people that use those reels, the SLs, and they love them. Um, it's a workhorse. It's been really dependable. It's been super successful for us. And uh, we wanted to take the opportunity to kind of clean it up and refine it um, to bring it through to the next generation. Michael wants to know textured versus smooth lines. Uh, I'm a texture person uh, myself uh, because I think that they shoot better. They mend better. Uh, they pick up off the water better and float higher. Um, but I also, you know, know that, uh, there's plenty of people who don't like the sound they make. Um, you know, there's, there's pros and cons to it. And, you know, the pro smooth lines have gotten with AST plus, they've gotten pretty slick and they shoot a lot better, um, than, you know, lines three, four years ago. So, um, I'm kind of a either one, but in saltwater, I've usually have a textured line on. Yeah, I've I I favored the smooth at first, but I've been convinced, seeing the tests and and using them, that the texture just they flow better and and they shoot better. Uh, the one thing they do make noise in even in the guides when you're reeling in. I had somebody tell me um, on a, a YouTube comment that my reel sounded terrible. Um, on, a, on the TV show from the streamer show from last weekend. And it wasn't the real, it was the, the line, you know, singing in the guides as it came in because those textured lines do, you know, you put some pressure on a fish, they, they make some noise. Yeah. <clears throat> Mark, we're not going to tell you what the next new reel to be debuting for Orvis is. <laughs> That's top secret. <clears throat> Unless you want to, unless you want to, uh, <laughs> no, there are no, there are no sneaky leaks today. <laughs> Even with Sean Combs in the house, there's no leaks. Yeah. Not today. You've, you've done a lot of real work in the past couple of years. It's probably time to sit back and, uh, work on Helios four. Uh, you, well, you know, it would be nice <laughs> if that were the case, but, uh, I'm sure when Helios four, if ever, 
if we ever get to that one, um, there'll probably be a matching reel that needs to debut at the same time. And, you know, I think that it's the coolest thing about uh, designing reels for Orvis is that the uh, company's really focused and has been focused on continuous improvement and making things better and evolving and innovating. And so, you know, our reels, you, you know, we've, we've got a bunch of new reels on the market now. Um, and they're great. They're the best reels we've ever made at all price points. And, uh, but we're not going to settle there. We're going to continue to, to kind of innovate and what's next. So that's, uh, that keeps it interesting and fun. And that's, you know, something that, that we really enjoy doing is designing reels and we've got a lot of them to work on. Todd Tanner wants to know, hi, Todd, if things get rough, what's more important? Beer, wine, coffee, or dark chocolate? <clears throat> uh, well, you can't drink beer without coffee the next morning. I would say dark chocolate. Tom? Uh, I just rant and rave. You know me. Throw a hissy fit. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't know. Rum. If things rum? are really rough, rum. Rum. Yeah. Okay. Rum. Yeah, he didn't put bourbon on there, so. No, yeah. Come on, Todd, get with it. What's your go to rod reel combo, Sean? Okay, yeah. No, uh, go to streamer rod uh, is a Mirage LT3 uh, with a, uh, a, a nine foot seven weight Helios 3D. Uh, my go-to dry fly rod right now is a 905 3F with a Mirage LT2 and a Pro Trout Line. I've got a Pro Depth Charge uh, on the streamer rod. Uh, my go-to for two-handed work is this reel right here. This is uh, on some prototype uh, Mission Trout Spay rods. Uh, my go-to for uh small stream fishing is going to be a cfo and uh my go-to tight line is going to be here and when you start talking about things that are coming up uh go-to carp reel is a size three mirage lt uh and i use a an actually i use a seven weight heart uh saltwater all-rounder on this um yeah no and I, for bigger carp i've got a a 908 3D that I use for carp fishing, um, you know, to bigger fish. Nathan, you didn't expect him to just name one rod reel, did you? <laughs> yeah, there's not a go to. There's a go, I go lots of places to lots of fish. Here's one for me. What is the name of the bar you like in the Bahamas? It's Bones Bar in, in Freeport in the uh, Pelican Bay resort it's uh it's owned by a good friend of mine jason franklin um who is the uh owner of uh h2o bonefish h2o bahamas and um it's a, it's a great bar it's a great place and they have a good rum selection very good rum so too good of a rum selection <laughs> When will Orvis develop a LOXA floating equivalent for CDC? I find that our, um, whatever we call our, our floating, our dry floating uh, is, is more than acceptable. I use, uh, I mean, I, right now I, I actually, we do a lot of work with the guys from Loon um, and I use LOXA and I'm pretty sure we sell LOXA at retail. Um, so for CDC, that's a pretty go-to for me. Uh, there's other products, but box is really great. And sometimes, sometimes you got to just give it to people who did it right. You got an extra bottle of Loxa in your truck? I do. I've got four. <laughs> I, went in, I went into quarantine and I was like, oh, this might last through dry fly season. And I got I had two extra bottles. <laughs> and then I found one in my boat bag. And then I just found one in my boat. <laughs> and whereabouts in your truck are these bottles? Uh, you don't worry about it. 
<laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Tom, what is your favorite rum? Uh, if I can get it, I like Havana Club Siete Años, but uh, since I can't go to Cuba anymore, um, I like them on the sweet side, so I, I like Diplomatico. Yeah. Have you ever mm -hmm. had uh, Plantation 20 Year? Mm, no, I don't think so. It's probably too expensive for me. No, it's not. It's like it's like uh, it's not not too expensive. Our friend Henry Cowan wants to know what's your go-to cart fly for finicky feeders. Ooh. Henry, uh, what do you think, Tom? Mm, I don't have a go-to fly. I, you know, I don't. Know. Do you have a go-to fly? You have one, don't you? That I, works pretty well. I do. I do. It's a red eye carp nasty. Uh, is probably. I think it's a Dave Heiss pattern um, that we sell, and uh, it's it's really my go-to if I walked on a new piece of water that uh, I had no idea what they were feeding on or whatever. Um, it works for me. It's worked on mud flats. It's worked in rocks. Kind of worked everywhere. Mm -hmm. All right, Sean. Well, it's getting on to one o'clock. And we've wasted people's time long enough. I think. Um, I hope that um, I hope that um, that everyone uh, everyone uh, learned something new today, and and Sean help you um, pick your next reel. It's always a it's always exciting to get a new fly reel. They're just things of beauty, and um, you know, heirlooms because they last a long time. And um, hope everybody stays happy and healthy and um, gets outside. And thank you so much for tuning in today. It really means a lot to us when we get to interact with um, friends and customers. So um, it's a great, great opportunity for us and we appreciate it. Right, thanks Sean? for having, yeah, thanks for having me on Tom and uh, we'll talk again soon. I hope sooner rather than later. All right. Patrick. And I got to find that bottle of locks on your truck. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs>